So thank you for that really nice introduction. I appreciate it very much. And it's so good to be back in Philadelphia, where I spent many good years working on my dissertation <laughs> and having fun, too. So today I have to thank Annie a bit for the title of our presentation. She thought this might resonate with some of us a la DuPont. Uh, better Living with Chemistry, if you recall that one, some of you. So what I want to do today is introduce our session. Um, I thought I'd talk a little bit about AI for those of you who um, are not in this area, but I think it's very hard for people not to know something about it because it's been much in the news. I think almost every day there's an article about how wonderful AI did something or how <laughs> unfortunate some problem was, like with self-driving cars. Um, but AI today is really different from um, the time I was introduced to it uh, when I published my first paper at uh, AAAI, which is still the major um, AI conference, although it's changed its name from American Association to the Ad Association for the Advancement of Artificial Intelligence in order to become more international. So this was a um, paper with Martha Pollack, who is now president of Cornell. <laughs> so um, she has done very well for herself, and our advisor, uh, Bonnie Weber, who's now at Edinburgh. Uh, at that time, I was looking back over the conference proceedings of this um, AAAI 82, and basically AI combined the areas of reasoning, which were very important, planning, also very important, natural language processing, which was my area, and machine learning and robotics. So the goal was to create machines that could actually operate like humans, with human intelligence. And over the years since 1982 and before, uh, there have been many waves of optimism over the years, but also uh, several AI winters when there was no funding for work in AI. So today, I think we are uh, experiencing an optimistic wave. Uh, and also, AI includes more fields of research. Um, when I started working in speech recognition, AI, nah, there were no, nothing in AI about speech. But when Siri uh, actually was introduced, <laughs> and everybody started using their cell phones, all of a sudden, all the AI people, oh yeah, speech is part of AI. <laughs> so that was an interesting acquisition. Uh, also, speech generation. Uh, computer vision now, I think, is more, um, much more central to AI as well. And also, there are things like, um, yeah? OK. Well, we have to fix my slides. <laughs> But anyhow, there are a lot more, there's a lot more interdisciplinarity in AI now, and people are working with aha, economists, and uh, it's AI for education, AI for entertainment. Um, it's hard to find sustainability, transportation. It's really hard to find an area today that is not at least to some extent connected to AI. Uh, but today, AI, uh, I think, is sort of School, school back its, um, scroll back its uh, optimism about replacing human beings. And I was just at a, uh, a few talks a couple of weeks ago where people from Microsoft were introducing the notion of collaborative AI, which probably really is a more sensible way of looking at it. We're not trying to replace humans and really I don't think many of us ever were, but we're trying to collaborate with humans so that what machines can do better than humans can be added to uh, the human uh, uh, abilities. So today, AI is making many positive contributions. Um, there's been some recent publicity about the use of virtual reality to study uh, people who are exp experiencing autism and actually understand what their world is and to help uh, the people who are trying to help them uh, live in that world themselves a little bit. 
Uh, and also, there are lots of tools being developed to help autistic students become more socially uh, interactive. By allowing them to interact with robots, they feel more comfortable than uh, having to interact with people sometimes. Now, I'm not sure that Snapchat is <laughs> core AI, <laughs> but I had to mention, given our current circumstances, um, that Snapchat recently helped over 400,000 new voters register to vote, many in key states, and hopefully that will continue. Um, I know when I tried to do, um, um, do a, a uh, a vote this time, I had to do, I was traveling and I had to fill out some forms that if I didn't have two PhDs, I probably wouldn't have been able to do it correctly. <laughs> so I think uh, anything that we can do to help voter, uh, in increase the number of new voters, particularly young voters, is great. Um, there are also new predictive models for disaster relief. Uh, for smart agriculture, for medicine delivery, and also for education in developing um, communities, developing countries. Uh, in particular, there is a lot of this going on in Nepal, which has experienced a lot of natural disasters. Um, also, for those of you interested in the Olympics, Fujitsu is going to help score the 2020 Olympic gymnastics uh, to remove the bias that we have seen over the years from uh, people, ten uh, judges tendering to vote for people from their own countries. So we'll see how, that, how well that works. And also for those of you who are uh, baseball fans, uh, there, is, um, there is the ability to to uh, identify an electronic strike zone in, bo in baseball, but uh, I think the uh, umpires are not too happy about this, so we shall see how that goes. Um, and also, uh, this is something really cool. I was recently on a panel um, at a women's uh, uh, WeWorks where people from fashion, women from fashion, who are in the fashion industry, can go to develop their own new companies. And on the panel were a number of women who of color, and one of them had started a company where she was using computer vision techniques. Her company produces 40 different shades of makeup. And to match the shade of makeup that a particular person wants to buy, they match their skin color with the makeup shades using computer vision techniques. It was really fabulous. And this has made a tremendous uh, impact on the underrepresented uh, and the women of color communities. My own research group is working on spoken AI. Um, we're uh, building tools for speakers of languages that don't have TTS systems so that possibly they can build their own. Uh, it costs about a million dollars for a company to build a TTS system, if not more nowadays. So um, we're trying to build tools so they can do this with online data. And we're also developing systems that can detect deception in speech, and we're a lot better than people or polygraphs. So I can talk more about that some other time. Um, but today, AI faces many challenges, and I just wanted to mention those because we're well aware. As you know, self-driving cars are not safe, although there are some cities being built in China specifically for self-driving cars. There are, there are tunnels underneath the ground in these new cities where you only have self-driving cars, which is kind of cool. Um, and AI technologies can and do take over people's jobs, we know that. AI can invade your privacy and create and circulate fake news. And deep learning systems, which you probably all heard some about, these are machine learning systems trained on millions and millions of data points. Uh, but they perpetuate the biases that are implicit in that data. For example, there was a big scandal when the face recognition algorithms were um, recognizing dark faces as gorillas. Um, that's been changed. And <laughs> Machine translation in languages like Korean, which don't have uh, gender-specific pronouns, when they translated a sentence that included a doctor into English, even though the doctor was um, female, the pronoun was male. 
So this is also being addressed by our friends at Google. Um, and there are other, other cases of this as well, but um, I think I've mentioned enough. Um, except I do want you to know, and this is something that worries people, that AI software is being used to make some very serious decisions on whether you should get a loan or not, um, on whether an emergency response is justified or it's you know, a fake uh, report, uh, medical diagnosis, um, selection of job candidates. There was recently a scandal at Amazon when they were trying to uh, suggest that everybody should keep uh, just hiring males because they were training it on data, um, uh, the job data that they had previously co collected for themselves. Also on whether people should get paroled or not. Uh, and this is very serious. Uh, and also criminal punishment, like whether a person is likely to be recidivist. Um, and the trouble is that the people who use these systems often don't know their limitations. And so this is what we're trying to do now in AI. Um, for example, for the bias propagation, there are groups now established at Google and Facebook specifically to detect bias in the systems that they have built. There is a lot more general awareness in social media, and there are methods to add data, new data, to training corpora to neutralize these kinds of biases that we see. And also, there's a big push now on, not dropping things, on uh, explainable AI, so that people who are using AI systems will really understand the limits of the systems that they're using. And everybody agrees that more must be done. So this is just a quick introduction to our field. Uh, and now I want to start um, uh, with today's speakers, who are all uh, doing great things in AI for people. Uh, the first speaker today will be Rupal Patel. Uh, Rupal has a company called Vocal ID, which creates voices for people who have lost or never had their own voices. Um, that sounds like they would. And she can tell you how she does that. And also she can tell you how you can contribute your voices to her database uh, and help others in that way. And after the break, Dan Jurasky is going to be talking about some work he has done identifying biased behavior from uh, police body cams to uh, show police how they can do better and why they should do better and improve policing. And then Sri Nayar is going to be talking about his work in computer vision. Uh, and I wanted to mention, I know Sri is going to mention this a little bit at the, um, in his talk, but the coolest thing is um, Sri created and distributed um, something called the Big Shot Camera to provide um, experiential learning for poor kids, uh, primarily in India. And this has had a huge impact on that society. So um, with no further ado, let me introduce Rupal, who is going to tell you how she manages to do these cool voices that sound like people who may not have ever talked. <laughs> so the question was, what's next? Well, but actually, Annie, if you want them to, my question isn't about that, so we should let them first No, that's your okay. Question. Go ahead and ask a question. Okay, I'll try to be brief. This question is triggered by Dan Jarofsky's talk, but it may be of more general significance, and that is you basically have carried out social science studies um, and found out trends, um, some of which are disturbing. You're then trying to influence the the agents, which in this case are the police. And I'm interested in this, this ties back to David Labson's presentation of yesterday. Is it effective to talk about what has actually been found in studies? Or does this make people defensive, particularly if they tend to be authoritarian, in which case you put a, trash the studies, but just try to model things or make suggestions? Um, and so, the, I mean, this is a very 21st century question because nowadays a lot of people dismiss science and social science, and yet that's what you're using as the basis of what you're doing. And this may apply to some of the other panelists as well. Thank you. 
yeah, I guess this applies for everyone. I mean, for us, the, the idea is, um, yeah, I don't think I would try to convince somebody by saying, hey, this study shows that you did this bad thing. It would be more like use the study to inform how you design training so that people are made aware of factors that, like, here are, uh, uh, notice that saying, giving the reason earlier on tends to make people of, of whatever race more, less angry. And so this is a good, so put that into the training. So yeah, I, I, I'm not a training expert and some of you may be education experts. So I would assume that that would, I agree that wouldn't help. Anybody Mark, else, yeah? Yeah, Mark Thompson, uh, New York. Ca can we return to the question of trustworthiness? Um, <laughs> Uh, and, and of authenticity, uh, namely the problem of how people can discriminate between uh, uh, voices or images or information of any kind uh, uh, that they, they can be confident is authentic and, and trustworthy or not. Um, and in the way within that, I mean, we, we know in, in, in my world of news, um, intense anxiety about distorted and deliberately false news should we think of the emerging AI technologies as a help or a hindrance in this or some combination of the two? Yeah, I think that's for us. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I think um, although AI technologies create the problem at one level, I think they could also be used to be the detectors of that difference. So there are new techniques with like adversarial networks to try to actually look at the difference between the original sample and the thing that you're creating. So just probably in computer vision as well, is it the image or is it the... Um, fake you know, images. It, yeah. Or is it the fake image? Um, so I think that while if you're reproducing something, you can also detect that it is a reproduction, right? So that tool exists in the very nature of building it itself. I don't know. Yeah, I think that is a problem. I mean, we've been looking at the difference between trusted speech and mistrusted speech. And, you know, one could use that for good, uh, in a sense, to, you know, if you have a robot that is very, very um, highly accurate, then you want people to trust it. Or if it's, you know, someone, um, a home care robot, for example. Um, but on the other hand, I mean, just like anything, it could be used for bad things too. And how to prevent that, I think you discussed a little bit, that you should have something in the uh, system itself that tells you that this is not necessarily a real human, but it's an artificial voice. Right, I think, I think for many uh, other inventions too, this isn't the first time that any in, any good advance in technology has been misused. So AI is just a new label for the most for the latest new kinds of inventions. But I think we've been emulating um, many of our, our sort of human-like traits for many years, right? So prosthetics are now closer to what our, our regular limbs are. And so what does that mean, right? Um, and there was also questions about does that give you know, individuals who have these prosthetics and unequal advantage and so on, right? So we're just dealing with, I think, a new kind of beast in terms of how we have to deal with um, the unintended aspects. Now we just add that, oh no, sorry. You, um, one, one uh, computer science departments have been moving a lot toward adding ethics courses, which you would be shocked to know we never had. So Barbara <laughs> Gross is one of the people at Harvard who started them and, and, yeah. and uh, so we're starting to teach the one next quarter. Um, so at least you want the people building the technology to be aware of the ethical issues, which is novel for us, yeah, sadly. This is clearly a problem with images, particularly because, as you, I mean, you see this in the press now, it's not that hard to create an image that can be seen as being a real image. And there are people in the field, such as uh, Hani Farid, who has uh, worked with Regina Baichi right here, who basically their entire career is based on looking at the authenticity of images, which is image forensics. And it turns out that things that are not visible to us with the naked eye, machines can actually find as inconsistencies. And uh, so that's, that's an area unto itself. Am I, uh, yes, Eric Fona in New York. Um, as you, I'm sure you have read, uh, some, there is some kind of petition going around at Google 
to not work with the military, not allow artificial intelligence to be used by the military. On the other hand, the, the Defense Department seems to be developing plans for sort of automated battlefields where machines will decide who is a target and uh, you know the human control will just be eliminated. I mean, is there, I, I'm, I'm not accusing anyone here of anything, but uh, <laughs> what, it, does the artificial intelligence community kind of, it's not just think about this, but think about ways to actually prevent the inhumane uses of the technology that you're developing. Hmm. <laughs> I, I just wanted to mention, I mean, there was this recent book by Steven Pinker, which, which talks about, um, you know, calamities, but also uh, human-made uh, catastrophes. And if you look at the, the number of people who've died even in, in war, battlefield, you see that obviously over the years it's come down dramatically. So some of these people are not really thinking about AI systems making decisions as to which war should be fought, but even robots being developed to fight the wars. And if ro robots end up killing each other, I think we'd be better off than <laughs> us being involved in any way. So there's many ways to think about this. It's not quite as, as gory and, and, and as, as dire as what the press sometimes makes it out to be. For instance, Microsoft literally the next week decided yeah. that they would participate in it, and they have their own arguments for it. These are very tricky issues. They're not black and white, um, and I think they require more thought and discussion. Fortunately, I do think there are thoughtful people involved uh, often, and then there are others who are not. And so as long as you have thoughtful people involved, we can maybe keep these things in check. Um, Ruzina Baichi from UC Berkeley, formerly from University of Pennsylvania. I worked in so-called AI for last 50 years of my career. I was at Stanford in 1967 when John McCarthy started, and as it was pointed out, AI went through various um, modifications. I just like to say about this um, problem of working with military or receiving funding for which the military supports us quite, um, quite handsomely. And it's difficult to say no. So we are struggling with, with this whole issue of military funding. But may I remind you folks uh, that <clears throat> that the physicists had the same problem during the Second World War. And um, actually, under the auspices of the military, the whole A-bomb was, was developed. And um, so there is this problem that how do we use technology for better good? And as my colleague from Stanford said, I also taught a course in ethics. And it's really difficult to teach such a course, I have to submit to you, because uh, we are used to teach fundamentals, you know, how you, kinematics, dynamics in my case. Um, and in terms of ethics, you can point out you know, the dangers, but actually I really came to conclusion, you don't teach ethics, you teach ethics at home. When you are raising your children for certain values, and it's quite late when they come to the undergraduate <laughs> course <laughs> to teach them ethics, you may expose them some of the consequences of what we are developing. But as you know, every technology, unfortunately, can be used for good and the bad. And uh, Sri and I share very much how to use technology for the better men of the, the human kind, especially the as <clears throat> assistive devices that I am engaged in for elderly. There is a great deal what technology can do 
including the cameras, as he showed. So don't be despaired. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we are all thinking about it and worrying about it and teaching our students not to abuse the technology. So I think that's a very good way to end the session. Thank you, Vishnu. <laughs>